On this edition of It's a Miracle, a mother leaves her young daughter alone for just a moment and learns how quickly tragedy can strike. My mind was racing, going from one extreme to the other, going, okay, she's just playing, to, my God, she's been kidnapped. They told me every hour that passes by, the chances are less that we'll find her alive. Plus, I've been looking for you. A young boy is caught in the crossfire of two warring gang members. All I knew is I wanted Shafi to live. Just to live. I just didn't want him to die. A miraculous story of death and redemption. Tonight on It's a Miracle. And now your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight, emotions run high as ordinary people experience extraordinary events in their lives. We begin with a story where the emotional stakes are at their highest. A four-year-old child is missing, and all the signs point to a dark and forbidding place. It was late September in South Bend, Indiana, and the cornfields that surround this rural town had grown to their full height. Laura Cox and her daughter Gabby were outside enjoying the last rays of summer sunshine. Gabby is a wonderful little girl. She's very precocious, very vivacious. She has always had a natural sense of curiosity. She's always enjoyed getting into things. Gabby is the most precious thing in my life. Gabby's favorite playmate was the family dog, Sophie. We got Sophie when she was about 10 and a half weeks old. They became instant buddies. As soon as we got her, where Sophie went, Gabby went. They were thicker than thieves. It was just starting to get a little dusky. The phone rang, and I ran in to get it, not thinking anything. Hello? But it only takes a moment of not watching a child for the unimaginable to happen. Sophie! 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 Okay. Sure. Sophie! Bye-bye. And by the time Laura finished her call, Gabby was nowhere to be found. I called for her and called for her, and I didn't get an answer. And Sophie came running out the corner of the cornfield, and Gabby didn't. I immediately panicked, because whenever I call for Gabby, she answers. Gabby! I was almost afraid to go in, because I didn't know what direction to head in. It's a huge cornfield. I was out looking for footprints, trying to see which direction she headed off in, and I couldn't find anything. Gabby! It's like walking into a wall. It's like being blind. My mind was racing, going from one extreme to the other. Hello. Yes, my daughter, she's lost in the cornfield. Going, OK, she's just playing, to, my god, she's been kidnapped. <laughs> The police were quickly dispatched to the scene, along with canine units and an aerial search of the surrounding area. Captain John Williams coordinated the effort and made a television appeal for volunteers. We want to have everybody sign up so that we don't get anybody lost out here. We're going to it's take a, a roll bad call situation to be in. Gone out into the field. We've searched for the little you girl. could walk around out there in circles forever and never really realize which way you're going. Into a different location, so we started having people sign in so that we would be able to take a roll call and make sure nobody else got lost out in that cornfield. Gabrielle! 
We had a few hundred people prepared to do whatever we asked them to do. Gabrielle! Gabby! Gabby! With all these people out here, Gabby. Gabby. the helicopter, the dogs, the volunteers, everybody's here and we still haven't found her. Why? Why? That's when you start questioning everything. Why? Why can't we find her? Even people that lived here all their lives did not realize that that cornfield was that huge. It was like a huge monster had swallowed up Gabby, and in what corner of that monster are we going to find her? Gabby! 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 As long as there was daylight, I had a sense of hope. Um, once night started to fall, things got really quiet. There was a sense of dread hanging in the air. Now, we don't need any more help to come out tonight. At this point, uh, the police would... made the difficult decision to call off the volunteer search party. And the last thing we would have wanted is for someone else to either get lost or hurt out there in that cornfield. We'll have plenty of help out here shortly. When Captain Williams had made the announcement that they had called off the search, I just felt my heart just fall right in my stomach. I promise you, Laura, we're going to do everything we possibly can. And it's just like, my God, they've even given up hope. They must think my daughter's dead and why bother? The dramatic conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. A massive search for a four-year-old child in the cornfield outside her home in South Bend, Indiana, has come up empty-handed. And as night falls, police captain John Williams is forced to send volunteers home and rely solely on his own men. Search continues for a girl who's been missing. A few miles away, Mark Hammond was following Gabby's disappearance on the evening news. For some reason, it weighed heavily on my mind and my heart that she was lost out there, especially at night, four years of age. I prayed for her, that God would protect her and comfort her parents through this situation, and that he would reunite them. But they'd need more than prayers to find Gabby. They would need a miracle. I just want you to find her. They told me, Laura, you need to understand every hour that passes by, the chances are less that we'll find her alive, if we find her. And when you hear that as a parent, I know. I know. You're like, no, no, no that, I don't even want to think about that. I don't even want to imagine that. I did not sleep a wink. Gabby! My daughter's Gabby. out there at night. She's cold, she's Gabby. lonely, she's scared. I have no right Gabby. to be comfortable in any way, shape, or form so long as there's a chance that my baby's suffering. And hog futures are up 10 and an 8. Mark Hammond could also not shake little Gabby from his mind. I really didn't have a normal night's sleep. It bothered me, and I wasn't able to, to learn any additional information until about 8 o'clock. At that time, the police made another appeal to the public for help. As soon as I learned that the authorities were going to allow volunteers to go in tentatively at 9 a.m., I made the decision right away. Grab some boots and binoculars, and headed to South Bend. When the sun started coming up, they immediately kicked back into action. It was like everything came alive again. Then I had that renewed sense of hope. When Mark arrived at the scene, the police had not yet allowed the volunteers to enter the cornfield. I had become so impatient standing around, waiting around, that I decided to investigate a little further for myself. He couldn't explain what was guiding him, but something was leading Mark away from the search party to the other side of Laura's property and an area of the field left unexplored. I began walking through there and calling her name. Gabby! I was very surprised. The sound, for some reason, just did not carry very well. But miraculously, Mark heard a faint reply. 
I had only gone in probably 18 or 20 rows into the corn. So when I first heard her voice, I thought maybe this is wishful thinking. Gabrielle. So I called again, listened intently. And she responded again. Gabby. I was calling out to her as Gabrielle. I was running to keep talking to me. I didn't want to go in the wrong direction and lose her position. Gabby, are you okay, honey? She looked like a little child that had been playing out in the yard all day, dirty and scratched up a little bit, but not as bad a condition as I really expected a little girl that had been in the corn for 17 hours through the night would be. Are you okay, honey? Yeah. Well, good. What an amazing sure. feeling to be able to find her and find that she was in good condition, considering what she had been through. I had a cellular phone on my hip, so right away I called 911. I just want to let you know I have her. She's safe in my arms. And moments later, Laura was reunited with her child. As soon as I laid eyes on her, it hit me just what a miracle had happened. My daughter was there. It was in a, she was in a stranger's arms, but she was alive and well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a great honor to be able to put that little girl back in her mother's arms. No. Just a great feeling to be able to find the little girl and get her back where she belonged. It was the happiest day of my life. I was actually happier that moment than I was the moment she was born. It was the perfect ending to a story that had touched the hearts of an entire community and brought them together for a single purpose. The man that found Gabby is a wonderful, wonderful person. And the group of people that were looking for her, they're very sweet and loving and giving people. They have good hearts. That's what found my daughter. Mark Hammond believes that a mysterious guiding force was also responsible for Gabby's safe return. Sunday mornings, I usually attend church. But the morning that Gabrielle was still lost in the corn, I just could not in all good conscience go to church, knowing that she was still out there. When you feel like God is directing you to do something, respond to that. He's trying to get involved in your life and wants good things to happen. And sometimes good things also bring with them valuable lessons. The day I got my daughter back, flowers never smelled sweeter. The colors were never brighter. I'm looking at the world and my God, life is wonderful. The things in life that really, really matter are the little people at your feet. That's the biggest lesson, I think, that, that I learned. Six months after Mark Hammond was miraculously led to little Gabby, he was given a commendation by the Cooper Hero Hall of Fame. And Gabby and Laura were there to cheer him on at a special banquet given in his honor. We'll be right back. What would you do if suddenly and without warning your entire world disappeared? She explained the situation to me that she was driving and all of a sudden her vision just blacked out. And she almost hit a truck. One woman's remarkable journey of discovery when It's a Miracle continues. Someone once said that when one door closes, another opens. And if you approach life with this philosophy, every change, no matter how big or how small, can be seen as an opportunity. In our next story, a woman suddenly and unexpectedly goes blind. But closing the door on her sight opens another amazing and miraculous window to the world.
In early 1993, Lisa Fittipaldi was the picture of success. She had a loving husband, a thriving career, and a very busy schedule. At the time, I was working 40, 50 hours a week as a professional and driving to work and going grocery shopping and doing the normal things that we all do. And then in March, Lisa's life was suddenly thrown out of focus. I was driving down I-35 and there was a semi in front of me and all of a sudden the semi disappeared. For one terrifying moment, Lisa went completely blind. She dismissed the incident, but a few weeks later, it happened again. Deeply shaken, she called her husband, Al. And she explained the situation to me that she was driving and all of a sudden her vision just blacked out and she almost hit a truck. Lisa refused to get back behind the wheel and during the next month, the episodes became more frequent. I thought I was having a brain aneurysm because one minute I would see something and the next minute I wouldn't see it. Then the colors would start fading away and everything becomes like a milky color, like it has a handkerchief over it. But her doctors could not pinpoint the exact cause of the problem. Dr. Michael Nacol explains. Initially, when she was seen by her eye doctor, she started out with a corneal irregularity that made her vision distorted. Not only did she have hazy vision, but her visual field was decreased. Lisa underwent several surgeries to cure her condition, but her eyesight continued to deteriorate. And slowly, her world disappeared into complete darkness. It was like a gray, black obscurity. Even talking about it makes my stomach go into knots. It is incredibly hard to even describe the kind of panic you have. Lisa was eventually diagnosed with a rare form of vasculitis, a disease that was attacking the nerves in her eyes and that would leave her legally and permanently blind. The first thought I thought was, my life is over. Simple as that. You can't see, what can you possibly do? 70% of everything you do is done with your eyes first, whether you notice it or not. She broke down and into tears, and uh, pretty much she knew that in a very short period of time, her world as she knew it was going to go away. And that's a hard thing to take. Lisa tried desperately to adjust to a life in the shadows, but even the simplest activities had become an enormous challenge. Oh. Come here, napkin, honey. After a while, you feel like it's just not worth the effort. It's okay. The world is dark. Let's just stay in the bedroom. Because that, the space is comfortable, and you know where you are, and why move? She didn't want to fend for herself. Lisa was, uh, it was like, you know, hang a towel up for me, or get me this, or get me that. I think I started getting a little angry about having to do for her when I knew she could care for herself. And then, in May of 1995, Lisa received a phone call from a friend asking her to join her at a two-week painting seminar in Louisiana. She said, there's a man out there and he's supposed to be very motivational and he just sleep in a dormitory and you get away from Al because you've been with him day and night now for a year. And I said, okay, I can do this. The friend never showed up. So Lisa wound up, rather than canceling the class, she said, would you drive me to Louisiana? Lisa attended the seminar on her own, and the two weeks away helped boost her confidence. Although some of her classmates expressed skepticism about a blind person's ability to paint, Lisa became determined to prove them wrong. And I said, well, why not? Why can't I do this? If I learn how to get dressed again, and I learn how to eat with a knife and a fork and a spoon again, why can't I paint? Can darks be luminous, bright, and powerful all at the same time? Yes. If with Al's help, Lisa began absorbing everything there was to know about painting. We went through hundreds of volumes of art books, magazines, catalogs. And that's when I realized how difficult it was to paint if you can't see what you're doing. 
I put together yellow and red, and it's supposed to make orange, but you can't verify it with your eyes. How do you know you have orange? And that's when I started to teach myself how to feel if a paint pigment was yellow versus blue versus red. Once Lisa memorized the various color formulas, she perfected a technique called mental mapping, which helped her find where she was on the canvas. Soon, Lisa was creating beautiful life scenes in intricate detail. And before long, she was displaying and selling her work at art fairs around the country. Lisa's mysterious ability shocked everyone, including her close friend, Claudia Law. I couldn't fathom how she can paint with such depth and the detail. I couldn't even speak. I, I didn't know what to say at that point because it was so amazing. It was like watching a miracle. In the summer of 1999, Lisa caught the attention of Jason Siegel, a gallery owner from Austin, Texas. One day in the mail, I received a packet from Lisa Fittipaldi, and I get packets from artists all the time asking me to review their work and would I consider representing them. I was very intrigued with the work, you know, very intrigued that she was blind and that she could paint realism. Yeah, hi, is Lisa Fittipaldi in? Jason arranged oh, to hi, meet Lisa, Lisa for lunch and quickly agreed to represent her. The very next day, he sold one of her paintings. When I would show people these paintings, I'd say, oh, what do you think of this painting? And they'd say, oh, that's a beautiful painting. I really like it. And I'd say, well, what, what would you do if I told you that this artist happened to be blind? And they'd, they'd just be blown away by the, that, and they'd want to know the rest of the story. Seven years after her odyssey began, Lisa has become a full-time artist, painting seven hours a day, seven days a week, and selling her work through one of the largest galleries in the country. Her incredible transformation amazes even those closest to her. It blows you away that somebody who can't even see can paint these amazing paintings and get this you know, composition, balance, all these things that other artists are trying to achieve in their paintings. How she does this is a miracle. She sketches it out in pencil, she puts the color on, and she gets this incredible piece of art that is totally unexplainable. I'm not really sure there is an explanation as to how someone is given a gift. What Lisa has given to me, and, and I know she's given to others, is hope for the future. Life is wonderful, and that you should live every moment to its fullest, because you never know what's going to happen. I'm just very fortunate. It's always been an angel on my shoulder, or a leprechaun probably knowing me. One day, I would like to be noted to be a good painter, a good artist. And that's what I'm striving for. Talk about changing adversity into advantage. Lisa Fittipaldi is a living example for us all. And she joins us now, along with her husband, Al, from their home in San Antonio, Texas. Thanks for taking the time to join us tonight. Oh, it's our pleasure, Richard. It's nice to be here. First of all, Al, I hear that Lisa's paintings have been selling quite well. Oh, gosh. In the last, uh, well, since Lisa started painting, she's painted somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 paintings. And I think she sold 396. Or, Something like yeah, that. Yeah, of the four. There's four left, I know that. <laughs> well, after tonight's show, you may be down to zero. So, Lisa, tell me, when you're not painting, what's going on in your life? Uh, recently, my husband and I opened up a bed and breakfast in San Antonio, Texas, on the River Walk. And uh, we established a foundation called the Mind's Eye Foundation, in which a portion of the proceeds of my originals go to provide educational technology to blind and hearing impaired children in the public schools. And most recently, she's been signed with the Wentworth Gallery System out of Miami, Florida. So her works will eventually be seen pretty much nationwide. We're thrilled about that. It's amazing what you've achieved. It's truly inspirational. And I want to thank you both for joining us. It's been a pleasure meeting you and continued success to you both. Thank you, too, you very Richard. much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. Still to come. At a moment of great loss, a mother decides to honor her son by giving others the gift of life. It was for Shafi to give back because he was a miracle baby. That miracle was given to me by God. 
so that somebody else can have a miracle in their life. Do you believe that some people are destined to meet? That there are forces working to bring them together no matter what the circumstances? Well, our next story is about just such a meeting. It came to us from the book Small Miracles of Love and Friendship by Yitta Halberstam and Judith Leventhal. And it certainly lives up to its title. It's a story filled with love, friendship, and a powerful sense of fate. Like other 15-year-olds, Shafi Morel had dreams. To get his driver's license, to go to college, maybe even to play in the NBA. But life wasn't always so easy for Shafi. He was born severely premature, and doctors had warned his mother, Gail, that he might not live. Shafi weighed only two pounds at birth. When he came out, his lungs were fully developed. He didn't have any heart problems. His brains were fully developed, and the only thing he had to do was stay in the hospital to gain weight. He was a miracle baby. He was a blessing. He was my pride and joy. Stacy Morell was especially fond of her little brother. He was just the type of kid that people liked to be around, so when you said Shafi's name, everybody's face kind of just lit up, and it was a good thing. He knew that at a young age, you had to work to get things in life that you wanted. So he loved to work, and he did exceptionally well. Even Ingrid Burnett, the supervisor on his after-school job, could see the incredible potential in this young man. That's all right, sweetheart. Shafi was probably one of the most mature young men for 15. Bye-bye. Every day, he walked me down in the subway to the booth, and after I paid, he said good night. And he said, I just want to make sure that nobody doesn't mug you or hurt you or anything like that. I just found that kind of fascinating for a 15-year-old to think of something like that without anyone saying it. But on February 28th, all of Shafi's hopes and dreams were taken away by a random act of violence. Yo, I've been looking for you. What? What's up? Shafi's mother was just returning home when she received the terrifying news. What is it? Miss Gail! What? what? Miss Gail! What? I couldn't believe it. I hadn't even taken off my coat. And it was a young lady who had lived across the street at the time. And she says, Miss Gail, Miss Gail, come. They shot Shafi. They shot Shafi. It took me forever just to run those two blocks because he was only two blocks away. Oh, my God. Oh, God, Shafi. Oh, my There Shafi laid on the ground and he had this big hole in his head. He was just like laying there, just looking in a daze and just rubbing his head and just saying, Shafi, you're going to be okay. Just stay with us just a little bit. You're going to be okay. The dying boy was rushed to Children's Hospital. His sister Stacy frantically made her way there as soon as she heard about the shooting. He's going to be right. I go over to the bed. And I look at him, and I know that he's gone. He's going to wake up. He's going to wake up. He's going to be fine. And so my mother says, he's going to be okay. He's going to be fine. I didn't have the heart to tell her that he's not okay. It was just horrible just sitting there, just watching him. And not being able to do anything for him at all. All I knew is I wanted Shafi just to live. Just to live. I just didn't want him to die. When the doctors came into the room and said that there was nothing else left for them to do to bring Shafi back, a sense of relief came for me because I didn't know how much longer I could go on pretending 
like he was coming back. At the same time, my entire world crashed. There was nothing left to do but to remove Shafi from life support. And you're gonna be okay. There were nurses who came to us and asked us about organ and tissue donation. I kind of went off and said, why, no, I didn't want to donate his organs and things like that. But then something just came over me. It was for Shafi to give back because he was a miracle baby. That miracle was given to me by God. So it was my turn to give that miracle back so that somebody else can have a miracle in their life. After we said yes to tissue and organ donation, the doctors came back into the room and they told us it was time to say our final goodbyes. Are you ready? He just laid there, just like he was sleeping. Yeah, like he had going to sleep for the night. <laughs> that was so hard to say goodbye to him. So hard to say goodbye to him. Across town at Temple University Hospital, another tragedy had been unfolding. Larry Montgomery, a 39-year-old dentist and father of three, was on the brink of death from a genetic heart disease. Are you helping out your mom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. His wife, Sherry, tried to keep up a brave front, but her own heart was filled with fear. Inside my mind, I constantly had thoughts of losing Larry and having to deal with helping the children to live through that. Larry's only hope was a heart transplant. It's gonna get and looking at Larry being so sick, I knew that he couldn't last much longer. But weeks would go by with no hearts available. At long last, a heart unexpectedly became available late one night. Yes, Larry. I got a heart. I was quite surprised. When I called my wife, she thought I was joking because I my sense of humor, but I said no. Oh my god. You need to get down here right away. Let's join hands and say a prayer, shall we? When we said goodbye, we all held hands and we said a prayer for the donor family and the donor. Amen. We wanted to offer a prayer of thanks for the generosity of that donor family who had to make a decision to donate those organs at probably the worst moment of their lives. See you in a few hours, okay? All See you right. soon. All right. They wheeled him into the operating room and I was left there just crying. Because it was a sudden realization that maybe I wouldn't see him again. But the transplant surgery was successful. And after a few weeks recuperating, Larry returned home. And it was there that he began to wonder who had given him back his life. Initially, I didn't have thoughts about where the heart came from until my brother, who's a doctor, had found out that the heart was a 15-year-old heart. And it came from Children's Hospital. Sherry's sister heard the news reports because this was a well-publicized death. She clipped some of the articles out and gave them to Sherry, thinking that this could possibly be my donor. And at about two or three months after my transplant, I opened that envelope and read the articles. The clues revealed that the heart beating inside Larry's chest might well be Shafi Morell's. We were suspicious that he may be the donor, but we did not know for sure. Larry felt compelled to write the donor family a letter. 
I would be thinking almost every day about what I would say in that letter, but I just couldn't think of the right words. It took me 10 months from the transplant to write that letter. Early in the morning of March 2nd, 1996, you gave me a gift, the gift of a new life. Now I carry the heart of your loved one. Of your loved one. This steady heartbeat is a reminder of you and your loss. Unfortunately, your loss has enabled me to live on. When I read the letter, I cried. And I read it again, and I got very angry. And I said, who is this person to write me this letter and tell me that I had to lose something in order for him to gain something? You are in my prayers every day. When I read the letter and found out that the family wanted to meet me, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Gail's refusal to meet Larry left him sad and depressed. But a miraculous set of events would soon bring him closer to the boy who'd saved his life. The emotional conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. When 15-year-old Shafi Morel was caught in the crossfire between two rival gang members, it ended a young life filled with great potential and left a devastated family with the difficult decision to donate his organs. Larry Montgomery, the man who received Shafi's heart, wrote the family a letter, hoping to meet them. But Shafi's mother rejected his request, and so Larry moved on with his life. He took a job teaching at a local university, and it was there that he befriended a parking lot attendant. He would often ask me how I was feeling, he knew that I had had a heart transplant. You know, this is a really nice car you got here. Oh, you like it? He oh, also yeah. admired my car, which was an older Cadillac. That's funny you should mention that. I'm thinking about getting He kept there. asking me, would I ever want to sell it? And one day, I told him, it's for sale. Make me an offer. And he said to me, uh, I'll give you $2,000 for it. And I said, it's sold. Before he could take legal possession of the vehicle, the buyer needed to retrieve his old license plates, and so Larry offered to drive him home. He proceeded to drive into South Philadelphia to his home. I looked around and I thought, what am I doing? I'm in a strange neighborhood with $2,000 cash in my pocket. Why am I here? And we crossed Wharton Street. Was that Wharton Street back then? Yeah, it was Wharton. Larry suddenly remembered Wharton Street from the newspaper articles he'd read. The guy that gave me my heart. I happened to mention to him, I think my donor lived on this street. And he said, what was his name? And I said, Shafiq Morel. Shafiq. You know him? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Come on. My wife was a supervisor. Are you serious? And I had goosebumps. It was a, a very strange experience. And he said, would you do me a favor? My wife worked very closely with him and was very close to this boy. Would you go to that phone right there and Hello. call her at work uh, right. and Lyra tell her Montgomery. what you told me? Yeah, I I'm the gentleman selling your husband his car. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, listen, uh, I am a transplant recipient. I believe that I have Shafiq Morel's heart. I was just so amazed. Hello? And I felt as though I wanted to reach through the phone because it felt like a part of Shafi maybe was on the other I'm end of this phone. Looking at his picture right now. And I wanted to tell him that he had the heart of a very good person. Yes, th thank you. Then I asked him, had he ever met Shafi's parents? And he said, no, he hadn't. And I said to him, I think they may want to meet you. Thanks to Ingrid and the remarkable coincidence, the identity of Larry's heart donor was finally confirmed, and the Morells finally felt the time was right to meet the Montgomerys. Oh, thank you so much. Um, can I feel Shafiq's heart? Oh, sure, sure, sure. When I touched Larry's heart, I said, you have a good, strong heart here. 
we just both smiled at each other. Like it was meant to be. Oh, this is my wife, Sherry. Oh, it's a pleasure. So I was satisfied. I, I was happy. I was happy. Yeah, I was happy. When I first saw Larry standing there, I saw my brother standing there. He is tall like Shafi. He's very sweet and kind like Shafi was. He knows how to say the right thing at the right moment, just like Shafi would. So it's absolutely amazing to me how closely Larry and Shafi are matched. I know that Shafi's heart found a wonderful home. I know that Shafi's heart is being very well taken care of. I know that Shafi's heart is going to be around for a long time. This is one of the, the medals I won. This is a bronze medal that I won at the U.S. Transplant Games okay. in Florida. And I want to... I think we were destined to meet. And I think the sale of this car was just what pushed us on. That is just an incredible shirt. I do think that it was a miracle that all this occurred. That I was able to meet this family and thank them in person. I call Larry and his family my second family. Picture of Shafi. We keep this in our family room. It was a match made in heaven. I think it's a wonderful legacy that Shafi has continued to live on in someone else's life. It was possible to turn a tragedy into a miracle. Larry and Gail have remained close friends. In fact, he was there by her side during the entire trial of the two men charged with Shafi's murder. They were both found guilty and are currently in prison serving life sentences. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. Good night.